morning and welcome to our study of Virgil's Aeneid, the founding of nations in the will of God. Many of you who are joining in this course will probably already have read uh, Homer's great Iliad and Odyssey. It's not absolutely necessary that you've done so, uh, but it's a, it's a great help. Why? Because Virgil takes these books and builds his own epic upon them in, in actually very great detail. Even the purpose is quite different. Homer is showing us the necessity of cooperation and a, a sense of differentiation of skills and gifts uh, for the forming of a nation in the Iliad. In the Odyssey, however, he is showing us the centrality of the family and the glory of the family as the real purpose and center of uh, our life here uh, as we experience it on Earth. Now, both of these always under the will of God uh, and uh, with a, a keen appreciation of the laws of God. Virgil, on the other hand, is going to reorient those values. Now, properly, he will keep God, or the gods, as he calls them, at the top of that hierarchy, but he will place the nation as the second source or goal of our efforts, and the family will become third. It's not that he does not appreciate its importance, but you know, we, we Catholics, we Christians know that uh, Homer was really right on this, that the family is the center upon which civilization is built. And we'll see why Virgil reorients these to some degree as we go along. Um, but I hope you'll enjoy it very much. It's one of the greatest of all works. And we'll begin by talking about that, um, how it has influenced the ages, and then do just a little bit more on what a few of its great themes are. So with that, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Our Holy Father Joseph, pray for us. St. Augustine, pray for us. And our Saint Scholastica, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm Dr. Russell. I, along with my wife, have founded the St. Augustine's Homeschool Enrichment Program, which is a program that teaches a full classical skeleton uh, of knowledge from kindergarten through high school, and yet leaves the students at home at least a couple days of the week so that the family from which all education should proceed is, is kept central. I'm also the author of the Catholic Shakespeare audio series where I interpret uh, various of his magnificent plays in terms of their Catholic meanings. Well, enough of me. Let's go on to someone much more important. There are probably at least, well, I'm sure there are many more, but I like to cite seven reasons to study the Aeneid, besides its sheer artistic magnificence. That we'll sort of learn about as we go along, right? We'll have good opportunities in these next 16 lessons to, to see just how magnificent he is. But the first reason that it has been kept alive and it has been absolutely central in every Christian culture is that it's the foundational work on the relationships between divine will 
and the life of a people or a state or empire and the family and the individual. Now, obviously, the greatest of all such considerations are the sacred scriptures, but it, is, it, it handles these relationships um, not in passing, but in such a vast tapestry of time and development of the people that we, of course, are paying most attention to the relationship between the individual, between the people and God, as we should. Um, whereas Virgil is so much more focused on precisely the nation, and thus he, he, he really drives home in a way that's unforgettable that not only the people of God, not only the people of Israel are in this relationship um, where their nation is under the guidance of God, but every nation is uh, to greater and lesser degree. And of course, with that concept, we can never be entirely fooled into this silly idea of the separation, some sort of brittle separation of church and state. Well, with this foundational work of Rome as being a massive intention of the gods, it becomes then the myth, you could call it the legend, and you could call it the history, because all three are involved, which summarized Rome's ideas about herself, and then projected those ideas forward to shape the future by being, a, a fr henceforward, a fundamental classic of Roman education. In other words, what I'm saying is that Virgil understood what his people were thinking and feeling, what their tradition was, and he wrote it down and gave it form and body, and henceforward, it then served to help teach that precise uh, set of beliefs about this great civilization that we call Rome. The third reason is that the Catholic Church saw this epic as a typological prefiguration for the primacy of Roman Catholicism. What do I mean by that? You and I may perhaps think too much of Rome as the great persecutor of the early church. This is so. On the other hand, once Constantine has allowed for the dissemination of the church, Rome becomes, as it were, a divinely inspired and divinely formed political entity by which the church can travel through all of the known world and spread herself uh, with incredible speed, something which would become much harder when the empire falls and the barbarian battles begin all over again. So since the church learned to think of Rome as a cradle prepared for her by the true God, not by the ones who are misnamed or somewhat misunderstood by Virgil, uh, but by the true God, then this story of Virgil's of how it seemed to have been prepared and that it was prepared by divine will uh, became a very powerful expression of truth. And it became a fundamental of all subsequent Western education. Even after the great revolt of Luther, it continued on, and it continued on powerfully until the past was almost completely rejected in the post-World War II era destruction of education. Now you, of course, are lucky enough to be um, receiving your own patrimony, the gifts of civilization that should be presented to you in your liberal arts education, uh, in your homeschooling, or in whatever other arrangement of school your family has chosen for you. Uh, and if, if you doubt my, my, my claim here of how central this is, think of how many of Shakespeare's works, for example, are set in Rome. Not because he's an antiquarian, not just because he you know, he thinks history is cool, it's because he knows that Rome is a perfectly useful vehicle uh, to speak of Holy Mother Church, 
and speak of her in a time when England was a police state which had outlawed her.